Welcome to the Peaceful World Schooling Podcast, featuring your host, Angela Harders. We are committed to cultivating a peaceful world beginning right in our own hearts and homes. Together, we believe that the world is our biggest and best classroom, and the people and places in it are our greatest teachers. So I invite you to join me on the adventure of a lifetime, beginning with a conversation that can change the world. Today's episode of the Peaceful World Schooling Podcast is brought to you by the book, Tales of a Toxic Teacher, Exposing the Cycles of Abuse Within Our Schools, written by Angela Harders. In this book, Angela shares some of the shocking experiences that happen behind the closed doors of a public school classroom and exposes some of the many abuses that take place in school intentionally and unintentionally, and no one escapes unscathed. Tales of a Toxic Teacher is available for purchase on Amazon.com. The ebook and audiobook versions are also available for free to members of the Peaceful World Schooling community. If you are interested in becoming a member, just check out the membership link in the description below. Thank you so very much for supporting Angela and for helping to make the Peaceful World Schooling podcast freely available to all. Hello and welcome to today's episode of the Peaceful World Schooling podcast, where we are committed to cultivating a peaceful world beginning right in our own hearts and homes. I'm Angela Harders, I'm your host, and I'm also a special education teacher, the author of Tales of a Toxic Teacher, Gospel-Based Parenting, and the Crunchy Kids series, and the proud world schooling mother to two amazing children, Sophia and Benjamin. Today on the Peaceful World Schooling Podcast, I am so excited to introduce you to an amazing woman and mom named Lauren Utican. Lauren, thank you so much for being with us today. I'm so excited to have you on the podcast. And thank you to all of you listening for joining us as we have a conversation that can change the world. Thanks for having me. I'm so tickled to be here today. <laughs> I'm super excited to connect with you. I, um, Lauren is actually a delegate in the seventh district here in Maryland. Um, and I have seen you in a lot of like the freedom communities um, in Maryland and active in a lot of these freedom groups and just advocating um, for freedom in general. And then I happened to see a video that you posted a while back where you were sharing about being an unschooling family. And I was like, oh my goodness, I have to reach out to this girl. I have to talk with her in here. I had no idea um, that you knew what unschooling was and not much less that you were an unschooling family. And so I am so excited to hear about um, your journey into homeschooling and unschooling and just kind of unpacking all of that with you and how your love of freedom is also impacting um, the educational freedom that you're providing for your kids. So can you just, uh, to get us started, can you share about you and your family and a little about your story? Yeah, sure. Um, so basically my homeschooling journey started with my first child. Uh, she went to regular pre-K in our, we lived in Perry Hall at the time. Um, and you know, it was a cute little co-op and I would go and I would help in the classroom. And there was just a couple of things that really stood out to me that I thought were a little disturbing. Um, and this wasn't really the fault, I guess, of the teacher. She thought she was training the children, you know, to go off to public school Mm -hmm. Um, some things like they wouldn't let kids go to the bathroom except for a certain time, which was leading to accidents. Mm. And so kids were being sort of really ridiculed and shamed, but oh, these no. were preschoolers who really had trouble holding their potty for two hours or three hours. So, yeah. um, I just kept saying like, why are we doing this? Like I can take them to the bathroom if we, it's not potty time. Like, oh no, you can't do that. They have to wait. Um, so I just thought in my mind, like, my child's never going to go to a place where they're not allowed to urinate when they have to. This is crazy. Um, and so I, I, I started looking into like alternatives, like where could I send my child where they would be respected as a human? Mm -hmm. And one of my girlfriends who, uh, whose name is Colleen, and now she's actually my chief of staff, she had a son that was also in the same preschool. And she said, we should homeschool our kids together. And I was like, wow, that sounds like a crazy idea. <laughs> like, that's what I want to do. We home all day with my children. Yay. And by then I had another, like I had a baby then too. So I, I had my preschooler and a, a little baby. 
And it sounded like a crazy idea, but sometimes the craziest ideas are the best ideas. So, so I, I, I took the leap. Uh, I decided that she wasn't going to go to kindergarten. I bought some, you know, kindergarten curriculums and I'm, I'm very type A. It's like my worst quality. Um, so I just became this really demanding, controlling, you know, authoritarian mother every day with my poor kindergartner. And she would sit there for 30 minutes while I tried to make her learn to read and she would cry. And I was like, why are you crying? You should be learning. This is fun. And she just was not having fun. So at some point I was like, Colleen, this isn't working. Like my child is miserable and she's crying all the time. And she told me to read, um, I think Peter Gray's book. And so I read it and I was converted pretty much immediately. I switched over to unschooling. Um, I stopped with compulsory lessons completely. I allowed her to choose whatever she wanted to do when she wanted to do it. And um, really the rest is history. I mean, she refused to read after that until she was about eight years old. Mm -hmm. And now she's such an incredibly prolific reader. I have to ask her to stop bringing books everywhere we go. I mean, <laughs> She blows through 500 page novels. Like it's just nobody's business. So, oh um, and she didn't need me to do it. <laughs> so it was a humbling experience, right? When you realize your children don't actually need you to do these things, they mm -hmm. can do them all on their own and in their yeah. own time. So yeah, she, she creates her own education now. And of course I have three other kids. So I also have a 10 year old. He's always been unschooled. He very similarly taught himself to read around eight or nine. Um, and now he reads all the time. He mostly likes graphic novels. I mean, he's like a, you know, a, a little man that likes to read, you know, action. Yeah. He's not so much into the historical fiction that my daughter is into. Uh -huh. um, but I, I keep telling him, you know, when he gets through the, if I'm like, if you get through the whole Harry Potter series, I'm going to buy you a nice new laptop. <laughs> Well, you know, we'll see how that goes. Uh, I'm not above bribing sometimes if I want kids to like, you know, try something new. I'm like, you might like <laughs> Harry Potter. You like the movies. <laughs> um, so it's been fun. And then I have a five-year-old also. And uh, he's he's actually more interested in reading than the other two were at that age. He He's always sort of like to sit on the couch quietly and look at books. I mean, you know, most kids, when they're quiet, you're like, oh crap, what are they doing wrong? But he's the kid who's just always sitting with a book on the couch, mm -hmm. never crawl, never drawing on your wall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And then I have a one-year-old who's just a joy. <laughs> she's just the beginning little... of her learning journey or his yeah, learning journey. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. She's a smarty pants and uh, she also really likes to sit, sit there and, and look at books. Um, but she also likes to tear the pages out. So she gets mm -hmm. cardboard books still because my children <laughs> will be like, oh, she's our books you know it's like so emotional in our household about books yes I know the feeling my my son is the same he had board books for a really long time because it just pages would rip and it would like be ripping my soul apart you know, to yeah. see the pages ripped um and yeah. it's so funny that you mentioned you know the the reading aspect because when I first started unschooling with my daughter that was that was like my biggest fear and my biggest concern was, oh my gosh, you know, my daughter is never going to learn how to read. And I'm going to be the one person who has, I'm, you know, I was a reading teacher and then here I am with a, you know, kid that can't read. And it is just, it's been blowing my mind to, you know, do exactly what you said to, to take that step back and watch my child direct her own learning and direct her own education and seeing how she taught herself to do all these things without basically without me um, without me having yeah. to do any lessons without any you know worksheets or workbooks or like none of that stuff and just to see her thrive is like it blows my mind and I'm like this is the best kept secret in education and the world needs to know yeah uh, and so you mentioned Peter Gray's book I'm assuming you're talking about the one that is is it free to learn is that the one that yes, you were reading that's the one Yep. Okay. Yes. That is an amazing book. If you have not read Peter Gray's book, Free to Learn, I highly recommend that you get it. And I will put a link for it in the show notes um, so that you can have access to that book. Um, it is definitely a life changer. And I'm wondering um, what aspect, as you were reading through that book, were there any like ideas or principles that, that you could say kind of stood out to you about the unschooling philosophy that kind of caught your attention? 
it was almost like the idea that children are people too, that mm. you just literally aren't taught in society. Like yeah. we're always taught that we, we have to sort of, sort of insert information here. Right. And it's, right. and they're like these little like robots that will spit back out what you've taught them. Mm -hmm. And the idea that you can treat children essentially the same way you treat adults in their learning, that, that whole idea just I had never even thought about it. It never crossed my mind. Mm. Even though I like to think of myself as an out of the box thinker, I had literally never thought my children can learn things that I don't tell them, mm. <laughs> you know, and they, and they've learned, I mean, they have learned math without me. Um, I mean, my daughter, she's older now, right? She's uh, a freshman in high school, um, in homeschool. And she takes classes that she wants to take. So she's, doing pre-algebra classes right now because that's what she's interested in taking. She wants to have that as a skill. Um, and so she has a private tutor that helps her with that um, twice a week. And she loves that. And she picked it herself. I didn't have to say, you know, you won't be able to, you know, do this or that if you don't learn this. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, sometimes I give them like a real world idea. Like my husband and I have a small business tax and accounting firm. That is sort of how we make most of our income. Um, we also have investments, but that's sort of the, the bulk of our income comes from that. So I, of course, tell my kids, daddy had to take a lot of math classes. Here's the skills that he needed to accomplish to be able to do the job. If you want to do a job in a similar, um, you know, finance sector that daddy's in, you'll need to have these skills as a baseline and you'll need to go to college and you'll need to take these classes. I sort of explained to them and that was never done for me. I didn't enjoy school and I didn't want to go to college. My parents really made me go to college. They were like, no, no, you will go to college. We don't care if you don't know what you want to do. You'll still go. Um, which turned out to be kind of silly because um, I That's stopped. That's an expensive way to find out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, um, yeah, they would probably say, whoops, <laughs> now. Because I never, I never finished. I have one <laughs> class left and uh, I just can't justify getting the degree. I don't need it. I haven't needed it, it and it hasn't held me back at all. Wow. Um, so I tell my kids, like, if you want to go to college, great. You must tell me what you want to study. I'm not just going to pay for college. And also because of my values, there's only a few colleges I'll actually pay for. So <laughs> if you want to go to some crazy school, you'll have to get uh, a loan. And I'm not co-signing a loan for a crazy school. So yeah. <laughs> not to be harsh, but I'm still type A. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> just let go of the reins on education mostly. Uh -huh. um, but I'm not going to do what my parents did, which was, you know, pay for an outrageous uh, degree from a from you know a very expensive private school. Mm -hmm. it just didn't. It just didn't. It didn't make sense. It doesn't make sense for us. So yeah. uh, we're going to have to make sure they know what their path looks like before we're going to start throwing money at it. Mm -hmm. That makes a lot of sense. And I think too, because they're unschoolers, they're, they're having that opportunity to kind of explore what they like to do right now. Like your daughter's choosing to take a pre-algebra class. And I, I don't know of too many people that are in public school that would willingly sign up for a pre-algebra class if it wasn't forced on them. Um, but because she sees the value in learning that she's, she's doing it. And I, I know a lot of people, when they first hear the term unschooling, they, they do, they think it's kind of like, you're just not doing anything like there's no, I guess, formal instruction or anything like that. Um, but it seems like that's not the case for you. So even though you're still unschooling, she's still taking formal classes, but it sounds like the difference is that she has, she has a choice in the matter. Is that, is that? Absolutely. Correct? Yeah. And I tell her, you don't have to take any classes if you don't want to, mm -hmm. um, you, you take what you think you need that are the building blocks of the education for where you want to go. And if you're not sure, here's the basic building blocks that, that they're teaching in public schools or private schools. And if you want, you can start there and, and sort of make sure that you, but you don't have to. And she knows, um, I don't care. I don't have a judgment on that. I, I, it's like this faith that she'll be successful because I trust her as a person. Mm. It's a totally different concept um, than the one where I was just in constant fear that that there be, and let me tell you, it took really years of unschooling for me to finally be at a place where I'm totally, I've totally let go and I'm really not 
internally struggling constantly with like, mm-hmm. are they doing enough? Are they still going to learn? Like, is this the right thing to do? I'm, I'm finally past it and it feels so nice. <laughs> so we just like live, people ask like, what's your, what's your day like when you're unschooling? I'm like, what's your Saturday like? Cause that's what my everyday is like. like <laughs> it's like the weekend all the time when your kids yeah. are home. That's our every day is mm-hmm. the weekend. And plus my husband, and I both work from home most days. I mean, I work out of the, out of the area three months out of the year um, in Annapolis, but, you know, and my family comes with me because my kids are unschooled and, and they're homeschooled. We get to go as a family, um, like, like delegate Dan Cox and uh, also like delegate Neil Parrott. They also homeschool their kids and they bring their kids down for session. So it's pretty, it's pretty nice to be able to just pick up and go. You know, we used to spend two months out of the year traveling internationally. And that was what a, what a great education. I mean, obviously yeah. with COVID hysteria, we're not doing that right now um, <laughs> because I won't mask my children. So, uh, mm-hmm. so that was another interesting thing to go through, right? With when you're unschooling or homeschooling, I mean, our kids take a lot of classes too, and they were all shut down. And uh, that was really hard in the beginning because I needed to find avenues where my children could have access to the interesting things that they were doing before, like mm-hmm. art classes and science classes. We used to take those in person yeah. out here and everything was just really shut down. So we hired private, we hired private tutors, like a couple families. And uh, we had teachers come to our farm and my kids did a whole series on dissection and uh, yeah, all mask free in the middle of COVID <laughs> um, so that they could, you know, that. yeah, live, live a, as normal of a life as they could. And, and none of us got COVID. So just mm. throwing it out there. Um, <laughs> and that was even pre-vaccine world. So, um, yeah. you know, so it was really, you know, nice to, well, a lot of the other families were just kind of trapped at home and, and didn't know what to do. And they were doing all this online stuff. We, we were still doing uh, in person. We, we hired private art tutors and they did art classes. They did self-defense classes. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, we just, if you call a lot of businesses, they were struggling and they yeah. were happy to take money from, from people <laughs> who were willing to set up private classes. Yeah. So it was, it was an opportunity. And then, then you get to see like, you know, who agrees with you and, and who, who do you really want to give your money to? Yeah, for sure. That's, yeah. that's so, that's so true. And I I'm wondering also how that kind of works. Cause I know you have kids that are kind of in a wide range, you know, your, your oldest is 13, your youngest is one. And I'm sure within, you know, amongst the four of them, they have four very different interests and passions and things like that. How do you navigate supporting the interests of four very different, very unique individuals in four different stages of life? How do you handle that? Yeah, that's, that's one thing that I thought would be harder than it actually turns out to be. So a lot of times they still learn in mixed peer groups, right? A yeah. lot of the classes my kids sign up for, like we have an art class we take um, on Wednesdays. And that is my my oldest, who's actually now, she's almost 15 now. Um, my oldest, my um, second oldest, who's going to be 11 soon. And then my five-year-old now is taking it this year. Um, and then we're with three other families who have similarly um, spread out age group children. So everybody has their own little thing and they get to go to this class. And then the art teacher just sort of tailors the different projects to like, this is more in the younger kids abilities, but the subject area is all very similar. So they'll be, you know, doing art around, you know, under the water, you know, the sea or something. And so there'll be some more simple projects for little people and there'll be some more complex projects for the older kids. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually they're going to have their art show um, in a couple weeks, I think maybe two weeks. So I'll get to go and see what they've been working on the last uh, six months or so, which is really exciting for us. <laughs> I, I can literally hear them downstairs and I'm just thinking, who's running this place right now? <laughs> you know they're so so adorable so yeah that's basically we just mix the peer groups amongst the different families and then we like my the dissection class was just my older two um because my my five-year-old just put stuff in his mouth probably so (laughs) probably probably not good to be dissecting it yeah no (laughs) formaldehyde and five-year-olds maybe not the greatest (laughs) combination oh lord i can hear one of them just give me one second i'm gonna fix this problem sure (laughs) 
We are back. <laughs> Sorry for that brief intermission, that brief pause there. Um, okay, Lauren. So you were you were sharing about how they're having an art show that's coming up soon, and how they're taking all these different types of classes, and how even though they are different ages, that you're still able to meet the needs of the individual child, even though they have you know different things that they're interested in, different things that they're passionate about, and it's just worked itself out. Yeah. Yeah. And, and they, they keep me posted. You know, if my son tells me my, my 10 year old tells me he wants to do something specific, you know, I try and connect him with the resource that he needs and, um, you know, help, help him find what class he might find interesting. And mm -hmm. sometimes he'll take classes on out school. Um, he gets co comic books, a lot of comic books. He loves comic books. Um, but mostly it's just about sort of asking your child and building a regular relationship with your child so that you can figure out who is this person and how can I be the best resource I'm almost like a librarian I'm like what resource do you need what can I connect you with that will you know inspire you to learn more yeah. um and it's a it's a lot of me saying you need to get, go outside everybody needs to go outside <laughs> it's a nice day there's not all these wonderful nice days all the time so please you know utilize the nice day and, and they build things in the woods and Mm -hmm. We are lucky we live um, on about eight, eight acres, so they can, oh, they can kind of explore uh -huh. and get out and there's, yeah, some, some woods and some places to, you know, get out and kind of hang out and they have their friends come by and, you know, we usually do like a, a co-op. This year, actually, we've been lucky, um, Colleen and a couple of our other friends created an unschooling co-op. And so my kids have been doing that twice a week on Tuesdays and Thursdays, just the boys. Um, so, and that they started out doing that in two different groups, right? The sort of upper school and the lower school. Mm -hmm. And in the end of it, they ended up combining them because all, all the younger kids wanted to do things with the older kids because they were learning from the older kids. Yeah. And that's the cool thing I think about unschooling and not having structured curriculum that you're using. Yeah. Um, your kids can really learn from each other. And a really effective way to teach people, I mean, for you to learn is to teach. And so my older kids, a lot of times will read to the younger kids or will teach the younger kids what they're learning. Mm -hmm. um, and so it really elevates those younger kids. It lets them learn things even earlier. Mm -hmm. um, so it's, that's been kind of fun to see. And that's, and it's played out not just in our home, but even in their own co-op, it's, it's played out the same way. So mm -hmm. that's been a really fun thing. I and mean, we've done co-ops in the past, but um but this one is great. It's literally like a regular school day length, but um, they just have some little lessons like Americanism and things like that. And then they, they do crafts outside. It's, it's really mostly outside. That's so awesome. It's, is that, yeah, is that, that school open for extra kids or, or not at the yes, moment? Yes, if you, yeah, no, I'm sure they would take another family. Yeah, they, they are over in um, Hampstead, they meet at, over in Hampstead. So it's, it's kind of far from my house because I live in Hartford County, um, but Colleen actually lives um, right near me. So she drives past my house, grabs my boys and goes over there um, and, nice. and hangs out there. Yeah, so it, it really worked out quite well because it's really not a bad drive for me, but it's probably like 35 minutes. Uh -huh. um, and with my schedule, that's a, that eats into my day. <laughs> Yeah. And yeah. it would be great if I had service the whole way, then I could still like at least work a little bit on the way yeah. there. But uh, the service is spotty on the road <laughs> there. So even the, if you can't even really make a phone call, it's not, it's not yeah. good. It's oh not my good for my, for my schedule, my crazy schedule. So, but yeah, if you want to join, let me know. I'll, I'll definitely give you the info about, about it. I have to see if they have a website. I don't even know. <laughs> I just awesome. text Colleen all my questions. I'm like, <laughs> I owe you guys money. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. And, and like, I love how you're talking about how the older kids are teaching the younger kids. The younger kids are learning from the older kids. And I'm sure the younger kids are even teaching the older kids things because they're learning how to teach and how to communicate and convey information to someone else in a way that they can understand, which is another great, valuable skill for them to learn. And I, you know, when I was teaching, they would always talk about how, you know, in the classroom that we're, we're preparing students for real life, you know, we're preparing them for real life. And they would say that over and over and over again, like we're preparing kids for real life. And I remember sitting in my classroom thinking like, when else in real life are you trapped in a room with 30 other strangers that are happen to be the same age as you just because you all happen to be born 
at the same time. Like that is not real. <laughs> that's not real life at all. Like not at all. Um, in any job that you yeah. go to, you're going to be working with people that are all different ages and backgrounds and cultures and all these kinds of things. And, you know, when you're homeschooled, you have that opportunity to be with kids and not just kids, but even adults and elderly people and people of all ages, um, that you can hang out with and learn to have relationships with and learn from them. Um, and I know you were talking before about how, when you kind of started oh, yeah. feeling that you had, you had this like tension almost that you mentioned, you had a lot of concerns about, you know, am I doing enough or are they doing enough? Are they learning? Are they getting what they need? Um, but then you said that now you kind of don't have those concerns anymore. And I'm wondering how did you transition from from dealing with those concerns that I think are very normal. I feel like every unschooling family goes through that transition where, you know, you have those fears and concerns of exactly what you said. Am I doing enough? Are they learning enough? Is my kid getting everything that they need? Uh, will my child be successful? Am I ruining their life? You know, how did you move from having those concerns to where you are now that you have peace and, and those concerns kinds of aren't really a, a factor for you anymore? I think some of the biggest things that sort of helped me calm down were just seeing, you know, over the years, the things that the kids picked up that I never taught them. Mm -hmm. um, watching my son develop math skills, watching my five-year-old who I had never taught to count, just all of a sudden count to 20 when we're sitting at the kitchen table, when he's counting off things. And I'm thinking, I never even taught you that, you know, it just reminds you they don't, they don't need you <laughs> to do that for them. They can literally do it on their own without you. And he probably learned it from his brother. They were playing a game together or something. And, and his brother probably taught him how to count or, um, yeah. So just the, those moments and sort of taking note of them. And then I make sure when I see it happen, I mean, I'm so blessed because my husband, he just tolerates my outside the lines coloring all the time. And he's really nothing but encouraging. Like every once in a while, he'll be like, idea is maybe a little crazy um but he really usually goes with me on it uh so that's that's been really nice because then I don't have to like always justify to somebody else mm -hmm. what I'm doing but I do try to point out sometimes I'm like hey did you just see that Paolo just counted to 25 did you teach him that and he's like no I'm like I didn't teach him that either <laughs> he just learned it and he's like dang this really works you know <laughs> mm -hmm. so it's nice that is, that is interesting <laughs> I hadn't thought about that before I mean I know you read the book by Peter Gray did your husband read that book as well or is is he just kind of learning just, from you? like how were you, yeah. how are you both handling this choice to unschool are you guys on the same page What's yeah, that? we, we luckily are. I mean, we have what I would call a traditional marriage. I mean, I know it doesn't seem like that because, um, I, now I work outside the home and he doesn't, but our marriage is very traditional. Um, and that he was originally the, the breadwinner and I was the stay at home mom. And so I guess in the early days, I sort of established that the home is my domain and you are in charge of money making, and I am in charge of money spending and child rearing. And so he kind of allowed me to not have to worry about him, you know, interjecting constantly into my decision-making around our children. He's really allowed me to make most of the decisions. And sometimes he asks me for why, like, why did you decide to do this? Or why do you think this is a good idea? Um, but I think he understands that this is really my domain and I, and I'm, the buck really stops with me um, because he really doesn't have the time. To, to do it. I mean, he, yeah. he has to work. He doesn't, you know, this is just the way it is. So he's, I think, happy that even though these are some really out of the box things that we do with our family, mm -hmm. um, you know, and in his culture, it's very unusual. I mean, homeschooling is illegal in Turkey where he comes from. Mm. Um, you're not allowed to do it. So when he oh, tells wow. people that we homeschool our children, you know, they literally think we're crazy, but, um, yeah. How does your family a lot of family handle that? Like when, you know, when you're dealing with other family members, cause I know a lot of unschoolers and not even just unschoolers, but homeschoolers in general, I feel like a lot of times get a lot of pushback from relatives and family members that may not understand why they're making the choices that they're making. And then when you add in unschooling to the mix, I'm sure that's like another level of like, what, what do you mean? There's, there's no curriculum. There's no test. There's no quizzes. There's no, like formal learning, like what, what is happening? <laughs> you know, how yeah, do you handle I mean, when you have, you know, friends or family members that are 
maybe don't don't agree or don't understand with the way that you are choosing to educate your kids? Yeah, for us, I mean, Paris and I both have the biggest personality in the room. So <laughs> it's really hard for people to offer unsolicited advice to us. We just don't tolerate it. <laughs> we have a zero <laughs> tolerance policy. So pretty much everyone that's close to us knows if they have an opinion and it's not well-founded, they are wasting their breath <laughs> on us if they think we're going to listen. Yeah. Um, so we haven't really gotten very much um, negativity. Now, certainly questions. I mean, people always ask questions, um, you know, like, how does it work? And I just say, we'll find out. Every kid's an experiment. Mm. <laughs> I mean, I was an experiment. My parents put me in public school. They moved to what, you know, Blue Ribbon Public School District so I could go to a Blue Ribbon Maryland Public School. Mm -hmm. And after I got graduated from high school, they were like, mm, that didn't really work out how we wanted it to. And they put my younger siblings into private schools. Then they sent my sister to an all-girls private school. And they sent my, brother, my younger brother to a co-ed private school. And then it was just always a, a work in progress. So mm -hmm. to me, and that's kind of how I explain it to people who, you know, sometimes they'll outright tell me crazy things that they think are going to happen to my children. And mm -hmm. I remind them that their children were all experiments as well. And that, that, you know, a, a lot of parents who experiment with public school don't have good outcomes. And so right. that wasn't an experiment that I was willing to put my children into yeah. having been the product of public schools. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, 15, 20 years ago, I yeah. just wasn't interested in that, in that experiment myself. <laughs> and, and it's really an experiment because it's only really been around, um, you know, for 150, 200 years, mm -hmm. this compulsory um, education, I think it started in Massachusetts. Um, so, you know, it's, that's really the new way, the, the old way is private tutors and allowing children to find, you know, their, their areas of, of gift and talent on their own, and then, and then funneling your energy into supporting the child's natural inclination and right. natural skill set. If you do that, your child is going to be just leaps and bounds ahead in whatever industry that they're attracted to, because mm -hmm. they've had so many more years to just focus their attention on it. Yeah. Um, and sometimes I do tell my kids, like, you know, you should really learn some of the basics because, you know, as an adult, you'll, you'll want to have some of these skills. You'll want to have, you know, you know, decent grammar, but at the end of the day, when you're homeschooling your kids, they look up to you, not peers. Right. And that I think is one of the biggest differences. My children, you know, want to be like me and my husband. They, they aren't looking to other people that are the same height as them and saying, oh, I want to be like that person. And they're not looking yeah. to celebrities because we don't have TV and um, they're looking to us and the other other adults they know and so we're we're products of mimicry just like other primates are we see those around us who are successfully getting bananas from the tree and we're like okay those people are getting bananas I like bananas how can I get bananas I'm gonna copy the successful banana getters yeah. and in our family you know my husband and I are the successful banana getters so they're gonna pretty but if you're not right with yourself homeschooling may not be right right for you because it might drive you mad if you don't like a lot of your own flaws because your kids are going to have your flaws in spades they're like <laughs> a magnifying glass uh you know of your flaws so you know mm -hmm. a lot of the times that's the conversations that my husband and I have you know if he's getting frustrated with having them home all day because he works from home and I work from home um I'm like just remember the things that you're not liking about the children right now are things they learn from you <laughs> so if you <laughs> wanted to so improve you really have to work on you it's a lot of deep self-work <laughs> yeah. It, yeah it really truly is I feel like that that was part of like homeschooling you know it, it wasn't just my daughter learning things but also me learning and unlearning a lot of the things that I got from my own education, both in private and public school. And I, I really appreciate the fact that you mentioned that that home that public school actually really is the experiment here because, you know, as you said, it's only been around for about 150 years. And, you know, for us, it's kind of all that we knew. We didn't really know any different. Um, but for, you know, like, like our grandparents or great grandparents, I mean, they would have like public school was like terrifying for them. I mean, people really 
rebelled against the idea of compulsory schooling. And so, I mean, it's crazy how much things have changed in just a few generations to now we assume that public schooling is just the best way to handle education, even though we know that public school has all these really terrible outcomes, really terrible outcomes statistically. And, and even in our own experience, I mean, I, I can't tell you how many times I talk to, you know, adults and, and we'll talk to them about, you know, trauma that they've experienced in their life. And nine times out of 10, the trauma that they experience either stems from something that happened in school or something that happened with someone that they met from school. So there, I mean, it's just, schools in general do, they really do contribute to a lot of the trauma that kids experience. And that's, that's part of the reason why I wrote my book, Tales of a Toxic Teacher, um, because I, I was seeing the damage that we were causing to children. I was causing to children as a teacher within this toxic system of forcing children and controlling them and manipulating them. And, you know, the story you mentioned about not letting them go to the bathroom and, you know, all these other kinds of things that kids experience in school that we just take as normal, but at the, at the root of it, I mean, it truly is an abusive and toxic system. And, um, and so I'm just, I'm really thankful that you brought that up. I'm wondering what are some other concerns that you have about the education that you see in our society today? I know education is something that's important for you as a delegate um, and as a mom. So what are some, I guess, concerns that you have for the education system and what would you like to see done about those concerns? Yeah, oh, I have a lot of ideas. I mean, I think, you know, if we could just start from scratch, right? We're always trying to tweak the system as it is. Yeah. But if we could just start from scratch, um, I know it's hard. I, there are some interesting documentaries. There's at least one that I've seen in the last two years or so about you know implementing unschooling style of, of school in an urban area with high poverty um, and and low you know low low family involvement. That is really hard. Um, there's just so much um, individual trauma each child has had, mm -hmm. not just from you know their schooling, but also inside their home and family life. So, yeah. but I don't think that that means that this method doesn't work. I think it just means they need to de-school for longer and that the focus needs to be on building them as a competent human being and mm -hmm. teaching them that they matter again. Um, so I would love to see opportunities for, you know, at the, at the best case scenario, scratch everything, make everything unschooling, start mm -hmm. tomorrow. Let's hire people to just be conduits to let kids connect with what they want and give kids as much de-schooling time as they need to figure it out. <laughs> That's my dream. That's obviously unlikely to happen in the culture that we live in today. That's so my dream think, too, Lauren. That yeah. is my dream too. But, <laughs> and you know what, we can, we can really create that. Like there are there are people that are out there that understand the benefits of unschooling and that are creating these incredible spaces where kids have that opportunity. Um, I know for, for my family, we actually do that. We, um, we go to like an unschool school. I, I wanted to create one myself and then I didn't even know that we actually have one here in Maryland. It's in Catonsville um, called the Traditional Learning Community. And, and it is, it's, it is literally the unschoolers dream. Um, exactly what you mentioned, that, that space where there are adults that are there that are facilitating um, and are a part of like the learning, but the kids have complete educational freedom in what and how and when they learn, where they are, you know, who they're learning from, who they're learning with, all of it. And it's just, it's incredible the things that they create. And I would love to see, I mean, we've got these school buildings. I would love to see exactly what you said, scrap the whole thing and start, start from scratch, <laughs> start from yeah. scratch and, and go through, you know, that de-schooling process. Um, and for those who are not familiar, what is, I guess, could you put into your own words, what is de-schooling for people that have not heard that term before? Yeah, sure. So de-schooling is, is like what my, what happened with my daughter when I took her from you know, my type A compulsory education every day. And then I, I, I moved on to unschooling. There was at least two years where it looked like she didn't learn a lot. Mm. You know, it felt like she wasn't, certainly not academically a lot. She just mm. wasn't interested in it. She wanted to just play outside all day and do little kid weekend fun things all day. And at that point, I can remember my husband saying, um, it doesn't really look like she's learning very much. And I'm like, mm. 
just hold on. This is called de-schooling. <laughs> She's going to get back to self-education really quick. Just give us another six to eight months. Um, <laughs> but it was almost two years where wow. she wasn't interested in any of the classes that I suggested. Um, she didn't want to take anything like that. She didn't want to she didn't want me to read to her. She didn't want to read to me. Like it was a, a, a decent amount of time. And, um, and yeah. she doesn't have any developmental issues. She just, she was burnt out. She was yeah. burnt out from my constant negativity really. Um, and, and my compulsory lessons that I was trying to get her to learn. So mm -hmm. that's, that's what it really is. I mean, my other kids haven't needed it because they never went to school. They, mm -hmm. they never had compulsory education, but kids, that have gone through either personal trauma or have been in a compulsory environment who are switching over to unschooling, they could require many, many months of de-schooling where you just leave them alone and, and let them figure out who they are, where they're comfortable, what things they're interested in. I mean, you could have a kid that you had in public school that you pull out and you ask them every day for a month, like, what do you want to do today? Do you want to do something? And they're going to be like, no, leave me alone. Yeah. They're hurting. They're hurting. And they, and now that they have sort of no borders up, they don't really know they're paralyzed because they've never had to make their own decisions before. Mm -hmm. And yeah. so it's sort of them learning that process of things that interest me. And how do I make a decision about what I'm going to do today? You know, mm -hmm. how do I make a structured schedule for myself if that's how I feel comfortable? Like yeah. my daughter really loves structure. She enjoys it, which boggles my mind as someone who just cannot stand it. Um, even though I'm really controlling of other people. <laughs> Woo! I'm like, why is my dog not sitting? This dog should sit. I just said sit. Why is the dog still sitting? The dog needs to sit, you know? <laughs> my husband's like, I think you have to train them first. I'm like, really? Okay. <laughs> You know, so she's just different, you know, and she likes having a schedule and she likes knowing what she's going to do next. And, you know, my husband and I will book tickets to Europe three weeks before we leave and we'll, we won't even tell anybody and we'll go for two months. I mean, we're really just the exact opposite of structure and planning. Uh -huh. You know, we'll get to one country, decide we want to go to a different country. We'll buy a ticket and go to a different, I mean, that's how we are. Yeah, and it's it's weird for my two my two oldest kids who like structure and who like predictability to, to to be dealing with us because we're just so fly by the seat of our pants. But it takes a little while for kids to realize what type of person they are, what makes mm -hmm. them feel good, and how do they like learning? What's the best way for them to learn? Are they hands on? Yeah. Do they like taking online classes? Like my daughter takes online classes. She likes them. It doesn't bother her. She's fine as long as it's short. She she doesn't want to sit on a computer for six hours a day for crying out loud. That's crazy town, but she'll take like much. a 30, 40 minute class, um, sometimes an hour long class. And she could take that, you know, a couple of those a week. Um, she was taking a philosophy class until recently, but I think she said she could tell she wasn't politically aligned with the teacher after the first five minutes. So she, <laughs> she lived, she lived, she put up with it for, I think like six or six or eight weeks and then she's finally like okay can you unenroll me this is getting like really so annoying oh my gosh <laughs> yeah yeah you know people are always trying to shove their politics down your throat when you're a kid and yeah. luckily she's got a strong backbone so she just like smiles and nods and then just <laughs> whatever she wants to think <laughs> yeah so it good. took your daughter um it took your daughter you said about two years for her to go through that de-schooling process of kind of relaxing a little bit, figuring out who she is, figuring what she likes, figuring out what she wants to do. Um, and I, I know a lot of times we talk about de-schooling as it relates to our children, but de-schooling is also really important for us as parents. And I, I feel like it's that we're the most important person that needs to de-school because so much of the school trauma is what we're bringing to the table. Like we have our own school trauma that we're dealing with and our own indoctrination and our own pressures that are like our internal, you know, struggle that we're dealing with that we're kind of putting on our kids. Um, and that de-schooling process is so important for us as parents. And so I'm wondering what, what did the de-schooling process look like for you? Yeah, that was hard. I mean, mine lasted a lot longer than hers, you know, <laughs> because I still had that anxiety inside of me um, for several years. Mm. 
just wondering what am I doing? Is this going to blow up in my face one day? Am I going to be paying like crazy amounts of money for hardcore private tutors in like the last year of each kid's senior year to try and cram a bunch of stuff in there so that they can, you know, function in society that, that, I mean, honestly, it was probably for five years at least before I had really let go. And I was like, mm-hmm. this is working. I need to stop obsessing about it. And, mm-hmm. um, and I really tried to, to shield them from it because the entire idea of unschooling is that you're not doing that to your kids anymore. Yeah. So it was, which is hard for me because I, I like don't have a good filter at all. I share literally everything that comes into my mind. <laughs> so it was a really conscious effort to like filter my words when it came to education. Um, I mean, we do have things that are compulsory in our house. Like I can't live in a messy home. We have a huge, we have huge lists of chores. We have a farm, so we have livestock. So there are things my children literally have to do every day. I'm like, no, you will do this, but it's just, it's separating that out. Like you have to do these things so that we as a family can survive and our animals don't die. (laughs) And, um, and then their education, which is sort of like personal development. And Mm -hmm. I'm not going to dictate to them what their personal development needs to be Mm -hmm. um, anymore. And so I I try to be really careful about my words when I'm talking to my kids about their education. Mm -hmm. I'm a lot more delicate and nuanced with what I say. And I'm more suggesting and less dictating um, because normally I'm like, go out to the garage and get this and do it quickly, you know, but I, I just don't use those words when I'm talking about education and I, I don't want to burn them. I don't want them to hate it right now. My kids literally love learning. I could suggest almost any class to my kids and they'd be like, sign me up. Like, that's what you want to see. Like, that's how, you know, that, that, pro- that de-schooling process is over for your kids mm-hmm. is when like, you can sort of read your kid, you know what they kind of like, and you suggest something. They're like, oh, what a great idea. And they get excited about it. Um, The only rule I do have is if I've paid for something, if you said you wanted to do it and I paid for it, you've got to stick through it or you have to pay me back Mm -hmm. (laughs) because I can't just be throwing money away and not getting money back. So, um, you know, and I, we don't pay our kids for tours, but they do get money for their birthdays. So they have some, some savings on the side. Um, so if they do decide like, I really don't like this class, but I know you already paid $150 for it. I'll prorate it, but I'm not going to pay for the whole thing and let them drop out of it. And and if, uh, if I paid for it, it just is my little thing about being responsible with your money. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I, I feel like that, that makes sense, you know, like, and that, again, that's another part of teaching responsibility because if they were the ones that were choosing or paying for the class themselves, like they would have to deal with the consequences of either dropping out or, you know, figuring out if they were going to stick with it or not. Um, But even, even that of like being willing to say like, you know, I know a lot of people, parents will force their kids like, oh, you signed up for this. So we're going to, we're going to, you're just going to do it, you know, but being able to let your kids know that they have an out. I mean, that's brilliant. Like it's okay. If you don't want to finish taking this class and the result of not taking this class is that you got to pay for the part that you didn't do or you know whatever that that piece of it is because I think that's a huge part of our learning as well you know being able to try out new things and figure out I like this or I don't like this and and to let our kids know it is okay to quit like it is okay to say I don't want to do this anymore um and not just feel like they have to do something you know just because whatever you know and giving them that that choice and that flexibility and at the same time there's also value in them learning okay I made a commitment to this so I am going to finish it but I think at the end of the day when our kids have that choice of you know, do you want to honor your commitment and, and finish, or do you want to learn by, you know, choosing to, I don't know, deal with whatever that choice is that, you know, I learned what I needed to learn and I'm okay. And I'm going to deal with the consequences of not finishing, um, and have them, you know, really have that ownership. And, um, one of the terms, I think when people talk about unschooling, I'm not really a fan of the term unschooling, which is why I came up with the term peaceful world schooling. I feel like that communicated yeah. more what we were standing for. Um, but what I'm hearing you say as you're talking, I'm just I'm reminded of the term self-directed learning, and it and yes. um and that that self-directed learning I feel like is the biggest game changer in all of education. Truly, it, I mean it truly is, and 
you cannot have a self-directed learner if you are forcing them to learn. Like your right. child will not be a self-directed learner if they're having other people that are forcing and coercing their learning. It just, it won't happen. You know, right. the, the way you have a self-directed learner is by being free to direct yourself. Um, and so, yeah, that's, that's, it, it is challenging. And, um, but at the same time, it's such a beautiful thing to be able to see unfolding, like right before your eyes, you know? Yeah. Um, and I, I'm wondering also, do you have, I mean, I know you've, you've been unschooling longer than I have. So you're, you know, a little bit ahead of me in this journey. Um, what advice would you have for people that are listening that are either their kids are in public school perhaps, or perhaps they've started homeschooling, but kind of started with the, with the way that you began with the very regimented, you know, more traditional style. Um, what advice would you give to someone that's hearing us talking about unschooling or self-directed learning and wants to give it a try, but is not sure how to, how to begin or what to do? What advice would you give for that person? Yeah. So the first advice would be to anybody that still has their kids in compulsory education, um, especially if you're it's in a public school where they're masking your child, get your child out of school immediately. Those people do not care about your children. They are forcing them to breathe their own refuge all day long. It's grody. Don't let them do that to your children. Your job is to stand up for your kids. Get them the hell out of there immediately. Thank you. So that's my first piece of advice. <laughs> and honestly, the system will change if we opt out. If they start losing the $17,000, $18,000 per student they're going to lose because we're pulling our kid out, that sends the strongest message possible to the system that we don't like what they're doing. And then maybe we can change it because they're going to see that they're losing money when they treat our children this way. So that's yeah. the first piece of advice. Get them out if they're in there now. Um, the second thing I'll say, and it really depends on you know sort of where you are, but the idea behind unschooling and, and world schooling, which I also have called ours world schooling, especially since we literally travel a lot, or we did pre-COVID before all the mask rules, um, is, is that having radical faith in your child mm -hmm. is so incredible. And it's such a blessing to give to your child, to be able to look at your child and say, I know you'll succeed in this world. How can I help you? That is just life altering. And it, it really does come from within the parent. Mm -hmm. um, it really isn't something that you can teach your child. It's really you. You have to literally feel that you have faith in your child. Um, and a lot of it's faith in yourself. I mean, you have to trust yourself and you have to trust your child. And then you have to just get to know them. You know, so I would say anybody who's right now on the structured path and is thinking about throwing it all out the window because it's not working and their kids crying all the time and everybody's unhappy, do yourself a huge favor. Take an extended Christmas vacation from curriculum, draw it all the way out until, I don't know, February and see how you feel. What does your child look like? What do they act like? What do they sound like when you're not asking them to get something done education wise? Mm -hmm. Um, and you'll, I think the proof will be in the pudding. You will see your child's demeanor change. And, mm -hmm. and in that, in that regard, you're going to, you're going to know why, why would I ever go back to this compulsory learning style yeah. when I can see my child is, is emotionally flourishing is much happier. Um, but don't isolate either. I know right now it's so bizarre. It's such a hard time to do this because, you know, there's so few things that we can do. I mean, because I won't, I, not only will I not mask my children, I won't take my children while they'll be exposed to people who are wearing masks because mm -hmm. that's how against it I am. Yeah. So it is a little restrictive in that I have to create our own fun essentially. So, um, you know, we're going to other places. We're spending a lot of time in West Virginia where people are still living a, a normal life. Mm -hmm. um, I try to avoid Baltimore County as much as I can because <laughs> there's just nothing normal south of Harford County, really. Mm -hmm. um, so Harford County is still very normal. So if people want to get a break and get to a place that doesn't look like it's lost its mind, then Harford County is a good place to come in Maryland. Um, but good. even last year during COVID, we drove into Pennsylvania. We went to like a drag car mm -hmm. show and uh, it was normal. People were behaving normal. <laughs> mm -hmm. So, and that was like, you know, the height of the COVID hysteria. So try to find those things where you can escape from things that are not healthy for kids. And um, to me, it's just the whole, the whole situation we're in now where this, all these bad policies have continued to be propagated and shoved down our throats. 
um, we're conditioning children to have lower, you know, socio emotional IQs. I mean, they are yeah. losing emotional IQ points by witnessing what adults are allowing to occur. Mm -hmm. um, and the, mm -hmm. the strongest message you can send to your government is to absolutely refuse to comply, walk away and take your money with you. Mm -hmm. um, and that I, I highly advocate for that. And if you, you could take your kids out now, that's what I would do. But if you absolutely have to have your kids in school, pull them out before they count butts in seats, because they will lose that money the next cycle. So, mm -hmm. you know, you want to pull your kids out sort of September, mid-September through mid-October to make sure your kid's not counted. And mm -hmm. that sends a strong message too, to these um, really tyrannical government officials who think that they can stop your children from freely breathing. Um, yeah. And there's just, it just does not mesh with the entire concept of unschooling to cover a child's face all day. It's totally disgusting. I can't even believe that we're still living in a world where this is acceptable. In, in 20 or 30 years, they're going to look back and it's going to be a human right violation. But here we are today still living <laughs> with the people that pretend they care about children the most, yeah. claiming that this is a good policy and that all of these policies are helpful. And they're just True. so toxic. So toxic. Yeah. You got out right just at the right time. <laughs> Well, actually, I like that. I mean, really. I, I wrote a letter. Um, I wrote a letter back in April or May of last year. Um, to I mean, any any person that was like in government that I the governor, all the board of education, the attorney. I mean, literally everyone that I could. I like sent a letter. Sent it my senators. I mean, everything. And and literally just told them everything that you said. Like as a teacher, I know that having your child be masked is one of the greatest harms that we could ever cause to this entire generation. I mean, it is, it is completely illogical and not, I mean, the, the physical harm aside, but the emotional and the psychological harm that we're causing to children is, I, I don't think that we will ever be able to fully grasp the risk, the ripple effect of what we have caused for this entire generation for decades to come. Um, and, and that's one of the things, you know, for me, I, I'm so thankful that we were homeschooling long before this happened because, you know, as a single mom, I had kind of planned already, you know, that I want, my daughter was home. So I didn't even have to deal with trying to figure out the logistics of, okay, how do you homeschool as a single parent or, you know, when your kid's used to being in school, how do you pull them out? You know, um, but even for me as a teacher, like the thought of teaching to a sea of masked faces was so depressing to me. Or the fact that like my students would never get to see me smile, you know, like, or kindergartners that will never see their teacher's face. I mean, I can't imagine like how traumatic that is because we know, like we know the science about the importance of seeing someone's face and the importance of getting their facial expressions and, and how that cultivates empathy, as you mentioned, and like the Correct. whole psychosocial, emotional, all of that. Um, it is, it's, it's completely crazy what, what we've been doing over these last couple of years, but I appreciate you taking a bold stand and, you know, being willing to preserve, um, like that sense of normalcy and integrity for, for your children, because it is, it, it really, it, it impacts, you know, even me as an adult, like it impacts me when I walk into a space and it's a sea of mass faces, like that does something to you. Yep. Uh, and, and if you don't think it does, you're not paying attention. Um, so, you know, it's just, it, it's crazy. I feel like I could talk about that for hours. Um, I know, same. Uh, it's very disturbing, very disturbing harm that we're doing, but I just, you know, I want you as, as parents and anyone who's listening to just remember, like no one is forcing you to do anything. Um, if your child is masked, it's because you chose to mask them. And just like, if you don't like it, you can choose something different. You are not stuck. So if your child is in school and they're dealing with having to wear a mask all day, or they're dealing with bullies, or they're dealing with, you know, political agendas being thrust upon them that don't align with your beliefs and values, or any of the multitude of things like you and your child are not stuck where you are. And if your child is in an educational environment that is not supporting their physical, emotional, social, mental health and well-being, then make a change, make a change. You can do it. Um, and, you know, just like Lauren said, like we are, you know, we are that, that resource for our kids. Um, and, you know, we, our job is to help them pursue their, their unique goals and interests and passions. And we get to come along for the ride and watch the amazing things that they create in the world. Um, but, you know, it starts with us being that example of, 
I'm not going to tolerate anyone abusing or harming my children, whether that be, you know, the the bully in the classroom or the entire school system itself um, that really does serve as, as a bully to children. Um, and if you think that I'm exaggerating, please read my book, <laughs> Tales of a Toxic Teacher. You will see it is not an exaggeration. Um, but I, I really appreciate, Lauren, like all of the work that you do just as far as advocating for for freedom in general as and in particular for educational freedom um i just yeah i'm just so honored to be able to have talk with you today and to share like a very small glimpse into your life and your family and you your story um if is there any other piece of advice that you would like to share with my listeners before we sign off for today i would just echo what you said you know it's up to you all of us can decide to consent or not to consent. And the second more of us start not consenting and getting our kids out of the system, we win. I mean, we will win. Um, they, they can't stand up to all of us. In fact, it doesn't take that many of us yeah. to cause huge, huge impacts on bottom lines and budgets and things like that. I mean, mm-hmm. imagine just 10 families pulling their kids out of school in one school. That is a lot, that's hundreds of thousands of dollars that the, mm-hmm. the school was gonna lose. Yeah. Um, overnight, like the next year, that's that money is gone. So do it, do it. There's nothing holding you back, but yourself. And as somebody who spends all day with children and I work from home uh, and we own small businesses and it's a lot, but you can do it. It's just takes some time management. So, um, and people, if they want to reach out to me, they are certainly welcome to do that. Uh, they can email me at um, electarcon at gmail.com. It comes right to my phone. So if they have questions or if they want to get involved in um, fighting policy at the state level, mm-hmm. and people are welcome to reach out to me. I, I can connect you with really good online groups that help fight some of the COVID craziness. Um, in fact, if there's people that want to, that are on Facebook, there's a great group um, I'm in right now called, um, let me think, No Mandatory COVID Prevention Maryland. Mm-hmm. And they have some really skilled um advocates that are running that page who have been doing this a long time and understand the type of political atmosphere Maryland really is and mm-hmm. are very good at weeding out resources so that the resources posted in that group are can, are the kind that you can send to the legislators in Maryland to, yeah. and the policymakers. And it won't be stuff that they'll ignore. It'll be stuff that will that will perk their ears up and we'll have them actually listening. So that would be a great Facebook group to join if anybody out there wants to get involved in fighting against the bad policy we're seeing. Awesome. I will definitely uh, make sure to share the link for that group. I'm in that group too. So um, oh, I'll share the link for that one. And then um, how else can people get connected with you? I know you mentioned your email address, which I will include in the show notes, but are you on um, Instagram or yeah, Facebook? I'm on Instagram. How else can we get connected? Yeah. With you? So I, yeah, I have, I have, a, I have political pages. So I have a political page. Um, that's just, I think my name on, on Facebook, but truthfully, I, I don't check it that much, but my staff does check the um, private messages there. And I also am on Instagram at Deep Red Maryland is my handle. And I'm on Twitter at the same. And actually, you can type that into Facebook. It should find me also. Um, I, I will sort of warn people, I am not a moderate. So <laughs> if you are not into far-right conservative women, I probably won't be your cup of tea. <laughs> so I do like to give a disclaimer. We do live in Maryland after all. Yes. Yes. Um, so, and, and truthfully, uh, you know, my political uh, beliefs have really been cultivated by my personal beliefs around um, education and around um, bodily autonomy and medical autonomy, um, things like that. So, um, the, the, I, you know, I, I, didn't, I wasn't born a Republican. Uh, I, I became one because uh, I realized that no one else cared uh, in Maryland about these issues that mattered to me the most, Mm -hmm. except for the Republicans. They were the only ones who would take the meetings. Wow. Well, thank you so much for sharing that. And, and I'm so thankful for the work that you're doing, um, for freedom in the seventh district. Um, and if anyone is hoping to get connected with Lauren, I hope that you will, and that you'll continue to support her and the work that she's doing, um, in our political sphere here in Maryland, which is a little bit crazy right now. Um, but please get connected with her and, and look for ways that you can help support other people that care about freedom, um, not just in Maryland, but in your own states as well. Um, so please feel free to check out her pages and, um, 
Yeah, I'm super excited to see the work that you continue to contribute uh, as a delegate and also as an unschooling mom. And I, I hope that we'll get the opportunity to hopefully meet in person one day. Um, I forgot to mention too, I, you know, you were talking about places where you go with like unschoolers and stuff. And I actually have a group um, on Facebook too, that I'll make sure I include, but we, on Tuesdays and Thursdays, um, I plan like meetups and events and field trips and stuff around the DC, you know, Maryland, Virginia area. And um, of course we're all like mask free. So it, it takes a lot of time to research places that we can go, um, you know, without masks. Cause I, I have a very strong conviction about that as well. Um, and so, yeah, if you're interested, if you're in the Maryland, DC, Virginia area and would like to get connected with that group, we are the Peaceful World Schoolers of the DMV. So go ahead and look that up at Facebook and I'll make sure I include the link in the show notes as well. So thank you so much for joining us today, Lauren. And to all of my listeners, I hope that this episode was as much of a blessing for you and your family as it has been for me. Remember that there are new episodes of the podcast that are released every single Tuesday. So make sure that you subscribe so you will not miss out on a single one. Thank you so much. And I hope that your day is as wonderful as you are. Join us next Tuesday on the Peaceful World Schooling Podcast. I'm your host, Angela Harders. And if you enjoyed today's episode, click subscribe and be sure to hit the bell so you will not miss out on a single episode.